But let me first thank St. Anselm's College and the Institute of Politics for holding this session and for inviting me here and um, for your mission, which is to educate the public about government, about politics, about how we can be engaged citizens and make our government work for us. And especially for this Leadership Institute, uh, because it is so important for especially young women to have this kind of experience um, and to realize what you might become to explore your own potential and then get some skills along the way in how to fulfill that potential. Uh, my husband, John Hennessy, has already been introduced but I'd like to recognize him because he urged me to write this book, did some of the research and uh, some of the proofreading, which is the most onerous of tasks, as any of you who've written papers know. Um, sometimes I'm asked why I wrote this book. Um, I, as you might find out, and as some of the elected women here know, uh, from New Hampshire, any woman who's been elected to public office is pretty soon thereafter asked to give a speech about women in politics. And uh, I haven't yet heard a speech entitled Men in Politics. But someday, you never can tell. Um, they might want to catch up. But uh, in the meantime, I'd been uh, teaching also a seminar first at St. Michael's College and then at the University of Vermont, where I now am, on women politics and leadership. And I made two observations about my students. Uh, one is that politics was kind of mysterious to them. Um, it was kind of swathed in a mystique. You know, how do you get into it? Um, why get into it? And can you achieve something there if you do? The other thing I discovered was that um, there was very little knowledge about what had preceded their generation in terms of the women's movement, um, going back to you know Abigail Adams. So interspersed in this book, I have some excerpts from women who really fomented the revolution that we are all now the beneficiaries of. But I also wanted to tell these stories, not only in my own voice, but in the voices of other women, to make it more contemporary. And I think we learn through stories. You know, statistics are interesting, studies are interesting, and they're all important, but you can't picture yourself in a new role unless you actually have a pretty specific idea of what it's like. And that is why I interviewed about 100 women uh, for this book, uh, some of them in New Hampshire. And uh, it is their stories that I tell. But let me just give you the theme of the book by reading you an excerpt of the introduction. It is, a time for, it is time for a call to action, for new political leadership to emerge from the women of America. The stories of the women in this book and thousands of others like them who hold elective and appointive offices all over America are making a difference. Others work for change in their communities as volunteers, as activists. The problem is that they are too few. We need their voices as grandmothers and mothers, wives and widows, daughters and sisters to be heard in the political debate about the future of our country. The debate may be raucous, the process complex, and the rewards not assured, but we cannot stay out of it. Each woman's experience changes the nature and content of the conversation. Politics, as Hillary Clinton said, is not for the faint of heart. 
She said that to me last June. But politics is where the decisions are made that determine whether our children will go to war, whether our parents will live in security, and where the earth itself will continue as we know it. We have been bystanders to history for too long. We have no more excuses. We are educated, we care, and we are ready to enter the arena. Now times have changed since I was first elected governor of Vermont in 1984. When I walked into the executive office the morning after the election, I scanned the row of somber male governor's portraits with names like Ebenezer and Erastus. They stared down at me as if to say, what are you doing here? Now, when nine-year-old Melissa Campbell visited the Vermont State House in 2006 and came upon my portrait, she exclaimed, finally, a woman, it's about time. Well, that's where we are today where we do feel it is about time for women in leadership everywhere, in politics, in higher education, in corporate world. And we do see some extraordinary changes. Uh, Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House. Um, the first time I saw her sitting beside, behind President Bush at a State of the Union speech, and you know, sometimes during a State of the Union speech, your attention might wander, and you look at the people sitting behind the president, and her presence was as if somebody had torn the sign off the treehouse fort that said, girls keep out. Suddenly, the Congress was a more welcoming place for girls and women who could see themselves for the first time reflected there. We see in higher education, Drew Gilpin Faust, the first president of Harvard, which is equally revolutionary for those of you familiar with Harvard. Um, you don't see women's portraits till Miss Faust's will hang there. Um, we see a woman named uh, Indura Nouri, the CEO of PepsiCo, um, one of the top CEOs in the country. So yes, there are women in places we haven't seen them before. But when you look at the statistics, um, the statistics are somewhat sobering. There's one figure, and it's purely coincidental, but maybe it tells us something anyway, that I came across several times in doing research for this book. And the number, so you just have to remember one, uh, it's 16%. As many of you may know, 16% is the percentage of women today in the United States Congress, an all-time high. 16% came up again in the average percentage of women in the lower houses of parliament around the world. Now, you might think if we're 16% and they're 16%, that's not so bad. But this is my first PowerPoint. This is a list of 142 countries in ranking from the highest to the lowest in the percentage of women. And you have to scroll all the way down to the middle to find the United States of America. Out of 142 countries, we rank 71st. And Iraq and Afghanistan do better than we do. The women of Iraq and the women of Afghanistan demanded a quota when their constitutions were being written with the guidance of the United States of 25%. Iraq met it, Afghanistan exceeded it at 27%. And we must remember that these are countries where you risk your life when you serve in public life, particularly as a woman in Muslim countries. So you have to ask, Latin America is ahead of North America. Argentina leads the pack at 40%. So what is going on in these countries that is not happening in the United States? Well, the figure came up a third time uh, when I looked at the figures in corporate 
America. Uh, there's an organization that some of you may be familiar with called Catalyst. And Catalyst recruits women for corporate boards and CEO positions and top leadership positions. And talking to Eileen Lang, she said the percentage of women in these top corporate positions is 16%. And that is despite the fact that women have made up about 50% of middle management positions for about 15 years. So you have to ask, what, what is keeping women from going higher? Some would say they don't want to go there, they want to stay home with their babies. Some may, but it's a very small percentage, both who can afford to and a small percentage who actually want to. So, we have to ask some questions. And then just the other day, there was a little piece in the New York Times, I think it was the day before yesterday, that said 16% is the average pay disparity between men and women around the world, that women earn 16% less than men. So I know it's a strange convergence of figures, but there may be some relationship even between the pay disparity and the participation of women in political and corporate and educational life. So how do we change those figures? Well, I explore some of the obstacles, and you know many of them. The money, the loss of privacy, the vulnerability, um, but there are some other things. In this book, I, you know, there's no, one of the, as I go back to the mystery my students felt, and some of you may feel, you know, how do you become a politician? I write in this chapter, lawyers go to law school, doctors go to medical school, accountants study accounting, beauticians go to beauty school, and realtors take a test. How do you become a politician? What is the right preparation? Are there courses a woman should take in high school or college? Is it necessary to get a law degree or a master's degree in public administration? The problem is there is no roadmap or set of global positioning system coordinates to tell a person what route to take to arrive at destination public office. One reason women and some men do not consider running for office is, is that the process is more opaque than transparent, more mysterious than obvious. Any American citizen theoretically can run for office. The only legal requirement is age, 18 or 35, if you want to run for president. The perception is different. It's a lot of who you know. If women don't have these connections, how do they get them? Asked one University of Vermont student. I think the perception is still, even though there's a no smoking sign on the door, the perception is still that decisions are made in a smoke-filled room by a small group who only talk to one another. And that for an outsider to knock on this door it's very, very difficult. Well, the experiences of the women in this book and my own experiences have been somewhat different. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Um, I know when you see someone like myself now and some of the other speakers and teachers you're, you're having in, in these days of uh, orientation and training, you assume we've always been this way. <laughs> Um, we didn't start out. I, just to reassure you, um, was a painfully shy person. Uh, in my high school class, when I was elected governor, everybody was surprised, not only me. Um, I was not the most likely person uh, to do this. I learned to speak. I learned confidence by practice by caring, by letting the issues pull me into the fray. Uh, what does it take, and I try to analyze this in my book, 
to step over that line between being a private person where you feel relatively safe. I say relatively because there is no ultimate safety even in holding back. But you know there's a difference between being a private person and a public person where your name is in the paper, you're vulnerable, people can tell you anything, ask you anything, call you anything. And what does it take to make that leap uh, from one sphere of life to another? Well, as I look at myself, I first ran for the Vermont legislature in 1972. And in that period, there were two what we now call revolutions. One was the environmental movement. And the environmental movement somehow grabbed me. I remember the first Earth Day. There was a new law in Vermont helping to regulate large-scale development. People wanted to repeal it. I wanted to be there to protect it and defend it. And that was one impetus for running for office. The other was the women's movement. And the women's movement affected me in two ways. One, it gave me an issue. Some of you may have heard of the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. It's been, on, it's been on the agenda ever since women got the right to vote in 1920. Um, Vermont was about to take it up. I had lobbied for Vermont to ratify the ERA, and I thought instead of knocking on the door from the outside, why not sit at the table and vote on the inside? Now. The women's movement also affected me in a personal way, my sense of timing. Uh, I had four young children. Um, I had thought, I'm not going to step back out into the world until much later when my kids are grown up. I always knew I would step out, back out. Uh, but I didn't know when and how. So the women's movement gave women of my generation permission. You can do it now. It also gave me a group of women, friends, and supporters who said, go for it. You can do this. And that was very important, because men still have a more automatic support system, because they see themselves reflected in the halls of power, not only in the portraits on the walls, but because of all the buddies that are there and say, welcome to the club. Women still have to at least in 72, this is changing now, have to form more of a club in order to say, you're doing something that is considered normal behavior, which running for office in the 70s was not always true. So those two movements were important. But then I think back as I try to peel off another layer of the onion that my childhood actually had something to do with it. I didn't realize this at the time. It's only upon later reflection. I came to the United States, as you did as a child, didn't speak English. We left Europe because of fear of the Holocaust at the beginning of World War II. And my mother told us what so many immigrant parents tell their children today. She told us anything is possible in America. And that anything is possible dream gave me a sense of optimism, that this was the country where you could become who you wanted to be. If I peel off one more layer, the Holocaust affected me in another way, not directly, fortunately, but indirectly. I did lose on my mother's side and on my father's side an uncle, aunts, cousins. And it left me with, it's hard to know quite the right word, maybe not responsibility, maybe not quite survivor's guilt, but something akin to that. And I thought to myself, I am so fortunate. I live in a time and place where I can speak, where I can act and not be afraid. I can do what the victims of the Holocaust could not do. And I should use that special position of opportunity to speak out 
when I have the courage, when I have the opportunity against injustice. So it's not something I thought of every day, but it is something that influenced me on some deeper level and um, was an important part of my stepping over, stepping over that line. Now, what can we do to help other, especially young women, step over that line? But let me, before I explore that, go back to the question in a broader sense of what does it take to be engaged, not just in running for office, but to speak out in your community, to take a leadership role in whatever form or level you're comfortable with. Well, I'll give you my other PowerPoint. And it consists of three boxes. And if you can envision those boxes with me. The first box contains anger. I think you have to have a level of anger in order to become active. And when I say a level of anger, you have to be dissatisfied with what's going on, whether it's the traffic on your street, uh, whether you, it's your kids having to cross the railroad track, as was my case on their way to school, whether it's the war in Iraq, whether it's our lack of access to health care, whatever the issue grabs you. A lot of women start from local issues, actually. Uh, their kids' education, issues that are very close to home. So when I say a level of anger, I mean a level. If you're too angry, you can go in either of two directions. If you're too angry, you can say, nothing's going to change. I'm going to watch the video. I'm not going to get engaged and be a participant. Wake me up in 20 years and let me know if anything's happened. We used to call that apathy. Um, if you're too angry, you could go in another, the opposite direction. You could say, burn the place down. Uh, we got to start from scratch. Nothing works. And of course, we've seen that throughout history, and we see it in other countries today. Um, but if you have the right level of anger, you move to the next box. And the next box contains imagination. You have to be able to imagine the world somewhat differently than it is today. You don't have to have all the answers to every problem. You don't have to know subsection A and subsection B or Roman numeral, numeral one. You just have to have a vision. And in discussing this the other day, I talked to a friend of mine, and she added another level of imagination that somebody named Professor Barber has written about. You also have, enough have to have enough imagination to imagine yourself in somebody else's shoes so that your concern for them is as important to you as your concern about yourself. Now, if you have that capacity for imagination, you move to the next box. Take that anger, take your vision of imagination, and there you find optimism. You have to be optimistic enough to believe that if you take the risks, if you make yourself vulnerable, if you fight the battles, that something is going to happen. And that is why optimism is such a key ingredient in political awakening in taking the risks of leadership in whatever venue uh, you may find out that you feel comfortable with. But you shouldn't stay where you are comfortable, as I say those words. Uh, one of the tests of leadership is to move beyond your comfort level. But you may want to start out there. You may want to start out there to test the waters. Well, I think one of the interesting things that has happened in this election season is that these three boxes have been opened by a lot of people. And that is why, in part, we have seen the huge turnout in the primary campaign. I think 
young people, uh, new voters, propelled forcefully by Barack Obama, but I believe also propelled by Hillary Clinton, have begun to experience that their anger, their imagination, and their optimism are alive again, that there is, to coin a phrase, hope, that there can be change. And that is vital to the life of a democracy, regardless of which political party uh, you belong to or which candidate you support. Because it's the people who do not participate who endanger a democracy the most. Well, how do you as young women picture yourself there? Well, let me read you an excerpt. Um, last summer, a young woman participated in a White House project, uh, which is a co-sponsor of this uh, training session. Uh, and afterwards, she wrote a blog about her experience. Some of you may want to write blogs about your experience. Um, let me see. OK. I won't read you all of it, but um, she talks a little bit about, let me just read you this, because it may resonate. Peggy, a leadership trainer and treasurer of the Minneapolis Board of Education, was here to talk about power. When she said the word, the participants gave what she called an expected reaction, ick. I attribute that reaction to the bitch complex. While the assertive man is a good leader, the assertive woman is a bitch. We don't want to be seen as aggressive, bossy, or otherwise unfeminine. We hold back. We speak our mind, but not too loudly. When editing articles for my high school newspaper, I often found myself tiptoeing around suggestions. I quoted criticism with a sugar tone and prefaced my critique with, this could be really stupid, but, but I knew I wasn't stupid. And it was frustrating that I didn't trust myself. Throughout the weekend, other women shared similar stories. They, too, cringed when other women played down their strength and cringed even more when they did it themselves. Together, we worked through our fears of having authority, learning to embrace it. I think if there's one thing you can get out of this weekend, that is important is to respect your own opinions, fight for them, argue for them, and risk being called a witch. Um, uh, it's unfortunate that this double standard exists in our society, but it does. And also, do not be afraid of the word power. Now, power can be defined in many, many ways. Um, one of the ways that I like to define power is you have power in order to empower others. Power is a negative when it is considered self-aggrandizing, only for your own kicks, for your own fame. But really, in politics, you do get the power to help empower others. And as I look back on my political career, that is probably the biggest thrill I ever experienced. Now the word, she goes on, the word politician connotes, besides corruption and such, a square-chinned, gray-headed, slick-parted white man in a suit. And that's more or less who's elected president. Girls of my generation, I'm 17, are told they can be whatever they want. But that message is not enough. Why can't politicians look and act like normal people? <laughs> well, they can. The women I've met this weekend are proof. 
where we at the White House Project knew that. It's another thing entirely for voters to feel comfortable, confident that the woman who looks like their next door neighbor, who jogs in the morning, who loves horror movies, spills coffee, organizes clothing drive, schleps her kids to soccer practice, and orders takeout, is responsible, intelligent, and driven, driven enough to represent them. Changing the face of politi political leadership is, to me, what is the most important mission. We need to shift our perception of what a leader looks like. And that is, again, the essence of how to get women involved in politics. Now, studies have also shown, experience has shown, that women more than men need to be asked to run. Now, I talked to a young woman who is president of Girl State. You have Girl State in New Hampshire as well. And she said, well, you know, if I come on too strong, people will think I'm stuck up. I'll lose my friends. Uh, so the fear of putting yourself forward and saying, hey, I'm good enough to run for office and to ask you to vote for me is a pretty strong statement. Uh, for anybody, but it seems to be, despite Title IX and sports, despite the fact that 56% of undergraduates today are female, despite the fact that mothers and fathers tell their daughters, you can do anything, there's still some holding back. There's still some holding back in the kind of obvious confidence that it takes to promote yourself for a leadership position. And it does take self-promotion. You can't just wait and expect things to happen without you taking the initiative. Now, I'm reminded of when I was in high school, which was a different high school than today, and we had dances. And the girls would stand on one side of the gym. That doesn't happen today, right? No. <laughs> And the boys stand on the other side of the gym, and you wait to be asked to dance. And nobody would walk across the gym to ask a boy to dance. Well, today with text messaging, all that has changed. Plus, of course, your attitudes have changed. But they have to change more. So the White House Project, the Women's Campaign Forum, have initiated campaigns to ask women to run. And that is why this leadership training is here. We are reaching out to you to recognize your own potential for leadership. But in addition to that, sometimes women need a different kind of help than men. Um, I um, spoke at a conference on women in politics in the Berkshires of after I finished this book, and I met a young woman named Trisha. And um, she was, had just been elected to the Pittsfield, Massachusetts City Council. And the way she described the city council, it was dysfunctional. Uh, people were disgusted because the city council didn't pay any attention to the issues people cared about, the education of their kids, the economy, safety. Uh, they watched on cable TV city council meetings like they would Saturday Night Live. It was entertainment. So they said, we got to do something. So they formed an organization, about three women started out, called WEN. We have to empower neighborhoods. Amongst themselves, they called it, we have had enough nonsense. <laughs> so they called, <coughs> they spoke to Trish and said, we'd like you to run. She said, I can't. I've got three kids. I've got a part-time job. I can't fit this into my life. I'd be happy to help. Well, they came back and said, we still want you to run, and we're going to help you. So this is the kind of help they gave her. One is they decided they would provide home-cooked meals to her family twice a week for the duration of the campaign. The next thing they said was, we're going to drive you, drive your kids wherever they need to go. 
soccer, little league, piano, you name it. That was the tipping point for her. They also gave her a notebook that spelled out in detail all the issues facing the city of Pittsfield. They didn't tell her which way to vote, but this gave her the confidence that she needed to feel she knew what she was talking about. Um, women tend to underestimate their own qualifications, uh, especially women who volunteered in the communities, who run clothing drives, who worked for the United Way. They already have a huge network. And as Kathleen Sebelius, the governor of Kansas, told me, any woman who's organized a birthday party for a five-year-old can organize a campaign. <laughs> and there's some wisdom there. And so that was the tipping point for her, uh, was the kind of specific help she received. They also did the usual things and ended up being an army of 250 women. They walked door to door with her, they did everything, and uh, she won. And in fact, every incumbent was tossed out, not only the candidates they supported, because they did energize the neighborhood to believing they could change the political system. So if you ever wonder whether this country can change, whether your neighborhood can change, just try to think back a year ago or a year and a half ago. Would you have believed that an African American would be the Democratic nominee for president? Would you have believed that a woman would come so close to getting the nomination? So this country has changed to a degree that few of us would have ever expected. Um, I do have to add, of course, we do have a Republican candidate who is more traditional, but also is in the race. I know you're nonpartisan, so I want to pay my dues. Um, but um, what's amazing is how quickly that has happened. Doesn't mean race and gender have disappeared. Both are still there and in fairly complex ways. The most gross part of racism and sexism are no longer politically correct, though some of the misogyny in the Clinton campaign makes you pause about that. But we've come a long way that we've gotten this far. So change is possible, optimism is possible. But let me just get to the last point of this. As we discuss women in politics, the fair question is to ask why. Would it make any difference? Um, why all the fuss, other than from the principle of pure democracy, we should have a government that looks like the people of this country. Um, we should have more Hispanics. We should have more African Americans. We should have more lower middle income people. Um, and obviously the power structure does not represent a fair reflection of that. But some people say it won't make any difference because women have all different opinions. And that is true and that is fair. Um, but having said that, women do, are Republicans, they're Democrats, they're liberals, they're conservative. Um, but studies have shown that women tend to vote in slightly different ways. And it only takes that tendency, it doesn't take a 100% vote in order to change the outcome. They also often bring in new ideas and experiences into the conversation that come from their personal lives. Well, let me give you the voting pattern. Imagine the United States Senate today, composed of 40 women and 60 men. Imagine a bill comes before the Senate that would require paid family leave, so that you have a baby, if you have an elderly parent, you can take three months 
Some countries it's six months, and some countries it's a year. Uh, without losing your job, without losing your paycheck. Let's say 30 of the 40 women vote for that bill. Some of them have reservations. Let's say 30 of the 60 men vote for that bill. Well, you can do the math. You've got 60 votes, enough to pass it, enough to override a veto. So women can provide the tipping point on issues that are close to their experience. And I feel confidently that if we had more women in the Congress today, women could have overridden, women and men could have overridden the president's veto on expanding children's health care. So it isn't as if women are only interested in these issues, but these are the gut issues, education, health care, the environment women's issues. There were no laws on the books about family violence. Uh, violence was considered a family private issue, not a question of law and police enforcement. So women brought these issues up in state legislatures and in the Congress. Why? Because still there's a difference. Any woman knows that when you walk into the parking lot at night looking for your car, that your fear is visceral. And while men may sympathize with that, they cannot feel it with that same intensity that comes from personal experience. And intensity in politics does matter. I got a small vignette of that when I was lieutenant governor and I was presiding over the Senate. And there was a bill that came up regarding the six inch trout. Now, the members of the Fish and Wildlife Committee were passionate about passing this bill. And I can't to this day remember whether it meant you had to throw the six-inch trout back or whether you could keep it. But they fought tooth and nail for the six-inch trout. They refused to suspend the rules. They held up the whole session. It was near the end of the session. And lo and behold, they got their bill. Well, a group of women were observing this, and the budget for the Commission on Women had been cut, an annual ritual in Vermont. I don't know if it happens in New Hampshire, but the women said, we're going to organize. We're going to refuse to suspend the rules till we get our budget restored. When they did that, the men were aghast. How could they play such dirty politics? I mean... To make a long story short, they got their budget restored. So those who fight most intensely, most persistently for the issues they care about have a better chance of winning. They don't always win, but they often win. So that is why politics is competitive, we know, about getting elected. Politics is also competitive about what gets on the agenda and where it gets on the agenda. And I know people like the former speaker of the New Hampshire legislature knows that better than anybody. And global warming, where is it on the agenda today? It's an asterisk. Last week, the United States Senate got only 48 votes for a bill may not have been perfect, but the first bill to actually address global warming. Why aren't there more? Is there more intensity about that? Because the people there do not reflect accurately, not just women, but the overall representation does not reflect the will of many Americans. Now, the role of lobbyists, of course, is another factor. But let me read you one excerpt. Well, let me just point to the Supreme Court. You know, in the Supreme Court, we have one woman today, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, we had one woman, and for a short time, two women, Sandra Day O'Connor. When Sandra Day O'Connor retired, she got many accolades. And one of the op observations that was made was she saw the law in practical terms how it applied to people's lives, not only in theory. Well, there was a recent court decision that 
speaks to one of the difficult issues of our time. It's called Ledbetter versus Goodyear Tire Company. Lily Ledbetter was a supervisor in the Goodyear Tire Company. She worked there for 20 years. After 20 years, somebody wrote her a letter and informed her that she had made much less money than the men who had the same job. So she sued. She won. Goodyear appealed to the United States Supreme Court. The court ruled five to four against her. And the reason they did was that she did not file the suit within 180 days of experiencing discrimination. This is part of what Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote. Excuse me while I find the right post-it. Well, I can paraphrase it. Oh, here it is. The court's insistence on immediate contest overlooks common characteristics of pay discrimination. Pay disparities often occur, as they did in Ledbetter's case, in small increments. Cause to suspect that discrimination is at work develops only over time. Comparative pay information, moreover, is often hidden from the employee's view. Small initial discrepancies may not see, be seen as meat for a federal case, particularly when the employee trying to succeed in a non-traditional environment is averse to making waves. Her initial readiness to give her employer the benefit of the doubt should not preclude her from later challenging the then current and continuing payment of a, depress, of a wage depressed on account of her sex. Now, Ruth Bader Ginsburg could put herself in Lily Ledbetter's shoes. Some of you younger women may not know, but both Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when they graduated from law school, at the top or near the top of their class, couldn't get a job in a law firm. Um, Sandra Day O'Connor recently gave a speech where she said she set up, she was offered a job as a legal secretary and refused that and finally set up her own little law practice in a mall along with a cleaning service and some other, not exactly your white shoe as the term used to be, law firm. So these women understood Lily Ledbetter because they had been there. And that is why it is so important to have women who have had these experiences, who can put themselves in other women's shoes in a political fray. But let me just direct a special message to you. you know, if you want to get involved, how do you do it? Uh, probably the best way is to, one, trust your beliefs. Trust your own passion about what you want to change. And to get some experience. Um, what a great area to be involved. Not all of you are from New Hampshire, but regardless of where you live, volunteer in a campaign. There's no better on-the-job training than volunteering in a campaign. Doesn't have to be a campaign for a woman, any campaign uh, at any level. You'll be doing boring work, but it won't be boring if you keep your eyes and ears open. I mean, you will know so much about how politics works. You may not like it, it may turn you off, but at least you will have had an experience. Um, and also, don't underestimate your own skills. It's nice to have courses in public administration. It is nice to have courses to have a law degree. I don't happen to, but it is not essential. What is essential is curiosity and caring. What is essential is asking questions. You don't have to know all of the answers. You can always find out. The political world is different from the academic world in that most of the information you need is contemporary, Perhaps there should be more academic background, but there's usually not time for that. And comes from people, is verbal conversation, verbal inquiries. 
talking to people, listening to their problems, talking to experts, asking them questions. So it is something that common sense and curiosity can help guide you along the path. Now, not everybody wants to run for office, and not everybody should, but everybody can help everybody if somebody else run for office. And working in the background makes a great contribution. Those women who cook those meals enable Tricia to get elected. So you can all be engaged at one level or another. Well, let me conclude by telling you about the country that is at the top of this list. Some of you may know from previous reports, it is very counterintuitive. The Scandinavian countries have traditionally been at the top. Interestingly enough, the Scandinavian countries also have the best, most progressive family work policies. Um, well, the country that's at the top is Rwanda. They are at 48.8%. And I called a woman senator. I had a student from Rwanda who gave me the name of the senator. And I said, how did this happen? How did Rwanda, Africa, genocide, uh, how did this happen? And she said, well, after the genocide, where 800, more than 800,000 people were killed, in 1998, and the country was pretty much destroyed. Um, she said, well, after the genocide, women went to work in their communities. They built houses, they repaired hospitals, they united families. And when the Constitution was written, again, they demanded a quota of 30%. Obviously, they exceeded it. And I said, well, tell me more. It still doesn't completely explain this. And she said, you know, we decided we had to do this for the survival of our children. And I would say to you, we in the United States of America can't let other people do the heavy lifting for us anymore. Uh, taking the risk, speaking for us, sometimes accurately, sometimes not. We have to speak in our own voices. And we have to do so for the survival of our children. Thank you.